Are you all through? Yep. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's, a, that's a hard act to follow. That. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, this is going to be all about you, honey. I just had my, <laughs> I had my woman up there. Thank you. Uh, and could, could you just follow me a little further? So I think we're good to go. We've got the wine. I've got my water because I don't have these things. Hold on, let's set this over here. Okay, who's going to tell the story about this? What was the story? Okay. It's obviously not going to be hard. It's going to be me. So, I didn't ask you this in the green room because I don't, I figured that we'd find the answer out together. When did we actually meet? Um, I met you in the, at the Light Gallery oh, no, in 1976 when you brought your portfolio into the Light Gallery. I'm not working on it. I won't tell the whole story. I don't know. But it was before she got famous. And <laughs> on Wednesdays, I think it was, at the Light Gallery in New York. People brought their portfolios, and we had to leave, they had to leave them there for two days, you know, and then like Friday morning, the director would look through these portfolios, you know, and nah, nah, you know, okay. But the, they wouldn't talk to anybody, really. But Sally had a body of work that the director said he was interested in, and Sally wanted to come back or he would come out and give her a few words of encouragement. Well, I remember it slightly differently. <laughs> we met again in uh, really, I guess it was 1998 when you came. That's what. That's why I had forgotten. I mean, I had forgotten about the white but. But the Jermaine did this? Yeah, oh my God. yeah. And she wanted to come down and take these pictures in Mississippi. And I couldn't have been happier to go around. Have we done this interview before or after we met? That's, um, that's really what I meant to ask. Not tell a long story. But I think uh, I bludgeoned you into doing this interview with the Southern Women. I was the photo editor here for so many years. But I think I bludgeoned Sally into doing the interview here. Uh, that was the year 2000? Uh-uh. It was 98. 1999. Uh, <laughs> yeah, about March to May, 1999. Anyway, it was a special issue about Southern women, and she very magnanimously agreed to do this interview. Uh, by that time, you know, your book had already come out. I mean, oh, you know, that when did Immediate Family come out? Oh, God, it came out in like 92. Okay, so she was, you know, already the sensation. <laughs> of photography, and so, I mean, this was a big coup for this little literary magazine, and I sent her these questions, and apparently she's going to try to read back the questions that I sent to her in 1999 and make me answer them. That's right. So that's my plan. So these are like extremely highbrow, um, you know, chin rubbing, and I... You know, eyebrow furrowing kind of questions. I, I mean, I got them and I thought, who is this woman? I don't think I knew you until. I think we met. These questions just like completely, they were really hard to answer. So, I don't, so I'm going to be on the spot. That's why you wrote them. <laughs> I didn't write the answers. You wrote the questions. So, okay, we'll just start with the first one. When were you first cognizant of seeing a photograph that made you want to try to take photographs for yourself? And when did you fall in love with photography and sort of my paraphrase of that? So this is my answer. Um, the first photograph I took um, that I really thought I might have something was, this sounds like, you know, some little prodigy or something, but I had an Instamatic camera when I was about 10 years old, and every little girl has those plastic horses, you know? It was, it was a big thing in my life, the beautiful plastic horses. So one day I took them out into the grass, and 
got them on the elbows and photographed those horses through the grass. And when I got back that enzymatic picture, this would have been, um, what, 1963 or something? It was an experiment. I was a babe. Uh, well, I was born in 53, so I was probably 10. Uh, so when I got back those pictures from the drugstore, I was just knocked out by the fact that, you know, this is something I could do, and I wanted to do more of it. And, and the only other art that I've really seen in my life was, you know, Life Magazine, Picasso, my parents took us to the Salvador Dali show, and, you know, it was, there was random, it was in Sarasota, Florida. Um, so I guess that's the answer. But when I grew up a little bit and got my own real camera, this is a 35 millimeter SLR, Pentax, by the way. That seems to be everybody's story for camera. Um, I was going to the Memphis Academy of Arts, and Bill Eggleston, again, another magnanimous person in my life, said, you know, well, come on over here a few days a week and you can be my assistant. And I said, well, what do I need to do to be your assistant? He said, oh, just drive me around in the right light, you know, maybe make a few prints every once in a while. So that's what I did. And, and he showed me stacks and stacks and stacks of his work. And I saw pictures of Lee Friedlander. He had just come out with that self-portrait book. And um, Cartier was saw. So I got an education in looking at other people's photographs to try and figure out what I was going to photograph. That That's a great answer. How did you know, were you happy with your picture because it was a good picture of your horses, or were you happy <laughs> with the picture because it was evocative and it held some universal I had resonance. never seen anything like that before. And in fact, I didn't really, you know, it became kind of a thing in art, like the uh, Laurie Simmons, yeah. photograph in the Barbies and all that stuff. After I got to New York, I figured out, wow, this art thing is a big old world. So, but at the time, when I was 10, I didn't know. I just thought, you know, that was something very interesting that I wanted to pursue. Can we diverge off from your questions yeah. for a second? How in the world did you get from Sumner, Mississippi to New York? Um, I drove with my no. friend. <laughs> <laughs> that's well, like that's a great New York story. story. That's, that's like, like yeah, that's a story. Yeah. Um, because, to make a long story short, we were flying, but then her soon to be ex husband came up and took the car and drove it back to wherever they lived. So, well, anyway, you are sure. not answering the question. Uh, okay. Okay. What was the question again? The question is so you went to the Memphis College Board and worked for Bill Eggleston, but how did you end up looking at Mike Gallagher? Mike Gallagher, y'all don't know, remember this because you're not as old as we are, but Mike Gallagher was the preeminent, most important. Yeah, yeah, there was well, there was two photography girls. It was Cusy. Well, there was Whitcomb. Oh, yeah, and Whitcomb. Yeah, well, Cusy was that one. Anyway, I got the job, full disclosure, I got the job yeah, for was Stephen Shore. Oh, no kidding. He called up Tennyson Shaw. <laughs> he was a friend of Bill Eggleston. And that was he was the owner of Light Gallery, uh, Tennyson. Tennyson Shaw was the owner what of the Shaw. Yeah. Um, so when I got to New York, I knew two people. I knew Stephen Shore and I knew John Tarkovsky, who was the head of the company. How did you know him? I knew everybody. Six degrees of separation from <laughs> Bill Okay. So I looked up John Tarkovsky, you know, he took me to a wonderful lunch and just trying to humor me along because that was Bill's first cousin. And you know, I said, well, I really kind of think I might want to be a photographer, and uh, I've been working, and you know, he kind of laughed and a big stash, and he was very patriarchal. 
Um, so the other person I knew in New York was Stephen Shore, who was, you know, going around the country with a view camera and taking color pictures. And you knew him through the I also knew him because I'd sat next to him at a dinner in Memphis at Bill's house. And he said, you know, have you ever come to New York, look me up. And I was thinking, hell yeah, I'm going to look you up. So he said, well, what are you doing in New York? And I said, well, I, I looked in the New York Times and I got this job and I, I just hate it. And, you know, I could be there at like 9 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was And she said, this well, is impossible. I happen to know that the people at the Light Gallery who represent me, and, and you know, photography was new. You could buy a photograph for 150 bucks in 1975. You could buy mine for $1.50. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can still buy mine for 150 But um, So he said, well, I'll call up the guy who owns the gallery and, and see if they're looking for somebody. I'll be damned if they didn't call me in there and give me that job. <laughs> so I ended up meeting oh, everybody in, in the history of photography. Like who? Because that's our next question. Um, How did the decade influence you? Who were the notable photographers and artists then whose work you were able okay, to Okay, I met, I met Andre Kertag, I met Harry Callahan, I met Eric Siskin, I met Frederick Summer, I met um, James Agee's widow. <laughs> he was long dead. Um, I don't know. It was just like getting a graduate degree in photography to work at the Light Gallery for the three years that I worked there. Who were the big photographers that they had? Um, well, the, I guess the biggest was Harry Callahan, Probably. Frederick Summer. Yeah. You know, they were still kind of not, not completely old school for photography to be important. It had to be black and white and you had to be from the concerned point of view. Um, and you know, Bill was the one that busted that ceiling about color photography being accepted as art. And it really was not accepted as art in, in, as art in May of 1976. Jan Gruber was doing it. Who else yeah. was doing it? Um, Neil Slavin, I don't know if you remember. Oh, yeah, maybe. Stephen Shore. Yep. Uh, there just weren't that many people that were working in college. Joel Marowitz. Oh, gosh. Yeah. And then that new group of kids who are now like 60 something. Uh, Nick Jepstein, yep. Glenn Gentle, Adam Marcos, Lang Clay. They were all working in color, but you know, they were like the young Turks. Mm -hmm. Um, so anyway. Were you I, able to do any work while you were in New York? I did work with my own books, yeah. And did you, when you had your lunch with John Sarkar, do, do you realize how lucky it is that... <laughs> I'm writing, I'm writing another little sort of, um, a little book. It's, I guess it's a... It's part two of It's a part two of all still. <laughs> but it's a sort of, the subtitle is How to Get Shit Done, but it's sort of about how how to get shit done. And one of the best ways to get shit done is to be lucky. And you, and that's, I mean, that's my last chapter. It has nothing to do with talent. I don't use the word talent in there, but you have to be lucky. And you have to work really hard. All that kind of shit. But you were just damn lucky. But you know, the thing, Sally, is that as much as I love photography and I love working there, and I, I did take a lot of pictures but the work that was important to me was the work that I did when I came back home, which was normally in the summer, uh, Christmas, between jobs, you know, like, I quit, you're fired. I had that kind of career. Did you quit or were you fired? Uh, like, well, I married him, mm -hmm. and that was, <laughs> that was a good move. <laughs> did not work for a minute. Um, well, I don't understand. He, oh, you married? I yeah. married Blaine. I did not marry Blaine. And I thought, well, you know, my career at Blaine's kind of, kind of 
I had another job lined up with Rick Zoli. Oh. And that fell through. I have, my career is everything falling through. You think I'm lucky, but I've had a hell of a lot of stuff that fell through. My through. whole book is about everything falling through. <laughs> but yeah. it makes you strong. It does. It builds character. So, anyway. Um, so uh, uh, I'm going to, I, I don't quite have the link here between Mary and Lang, who was in New York. Well, I wanted to go home for the summer. Okay. And, you know, that was where I was doing my work. And I had the privilege of doing that, to go home and get ready for my wedding. <laughs> it all sounds very frivolous. <laughs> but I guess what I'm trying to say is that the work that was the most important to me was the work that I did every time I came back to Mississippi. And we ended up moving back to Mississippi for good in the late 80s because we started having some children. One or two might be here now. <laughs> They're keeping a low profile. You wanted to come down to Mississippi because of the famous school systems down there. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. No, yeah. I, I'm sorry to say, I didn't really give that enough thought. But, um, I don't know, my heart was here, my work was here. I made Langdon move back from a really good career in New York. To can, can you talk a little bit about that, about my... So here's a little backstory to me. I had a very, very brief collegiate career, and my first college roommate was Lang Clay's sister. And she lived about 10 minutes from this college that I went to mistakenly called Bennington. And so I knew Lang's family and sort of met Lang a little back in. This was in Vermont, by the way. This is in Vermont, yeah, that's the point. Sorry, I'm getting off track here. But for, to ask Lang, who grew up in the in the very, very New England way to move to Mississippi. Can you talk a little bit about how that happened? <laughs> um, we went okay for a while. We, we kept our loft in New York for a couple of years because he was still working. But um, I think we both kind of figured out that New York was not a great place to raise a child. And um, so we ended up coming back here. And, and the last story is that it was just as easy to get to the airport in Memphis as it was to get to the airport in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> and FedEx came in. You know, you could FedEx your film back and forth. You could fax. This is like old school, you know, but at the time, you know, it was kind of, that was how we were able to do it. Like now, everybody's on the internet and Zoom and streaming and all that stuff. You know, that was the breakthrough for us, was to be able to come back here and raise a family in Mississippi. And it was really all my idea. But he, he went along. I bet. <laughs> but some of his work, some of his best work has been here. He's going to thank me one day. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so just so you get a sense of the kind of questions that Maudie asked in this interview, I'm just going to, we'll, we'll give her a chance to answer it if she wants to. I just want, I was really rocked back on my heels when I got these series of questions. It, this wasn't a live interview. She sent it to me, probably by mail back then. Mark Strand has said about poetry that one of the reasons people read it is because they want to come into possession of a mystery. Do you think perhaps the reason people have responded to your work so strongly is because of its mysterious quality? In other words, do you think people like to view your creative world to prove that a mysterious world really exists or to merely verify and validate the mysteries of their own world? Okay. <laughs> that was the question, but I want to read it all the answer. You don't have the answer, because I can find it. Okay. Here's the answer from Miss Liz Savannah. 
The creative act is mysterious in its essence, and every work of art confronts us with several layers of mystery, starting with some basic questions about the work's relation to the world around it or to what it is representing. So we come away from any good work of art with a freshened sense of life's mysteriousness. In a given case, the emphasis might be on, say, politics of wealth distribution, or it might be high ontology, way up there with go get us questions. Where do we come from? Where are we? Where are we going? And whatever the emphasis, the heightened sense of mystery is always there. I suppose one definition of propaganda might be the art that denies the mysterious. We will have a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry we got a little addled in our old age. <laughs> We're still talking like that. But do you so? <laughs> so those so that's the level at which she was operating at this point. And I struggled to keep up with, with some of these questions. They really were pretty. High level. Then she would come down to earth and she would say something like, How do you know when you are finished with the body of work? That's a pretty good question. That, that's a question I can deal with, right? Yeah. So, how do you know when you're finished? Uh, with the are you yeah. ever finished? With no, the body of work? I've never really finished the body of work. I mean, I still see the Delta Dogs, I still see the Delta landscape, I still see the portraits that were in Mississippi history. Um, I'm really having a hard time coming up with a new act because I can't quit projects. I, I think they kind of like novels, you know, it's a long novel. They go on. You know, Elizabeth Strout wrote that we all have one story to tell and we tell in a thousand ways. I mean, that's so true. Both you and I have a pretty intimate story to tell, I think. And the trick is to find you know, a thousand ways to tell it, but it's still just one story. Thousand crossings, right? A thousand crossings. <laughs> um, so, but can can we just talk about your working method in as regards that that question? So, when you, how do you work? Do you do you put your cameras in the car and say I'm just going to go out shooting today, or do, or do you well, say the light is always always have that camera. camera? You always have always your camera. have my camera. And in fact, I was I was doing the black and white. Um, Delta Land, Delta Dogs, and all that work um, in black and white. So I had one camera, a medium format, a medium 645, and loaded with black and white. And then I had my Rolleiflex with color film. So I always took those two cameras with me, you know, and they got beat to hell in the back from shaking in my car because sometimes I was going on. Some back roads. But, you know, that's my number one thing is if you want to be a photographer or you think you are a photographer, always have that camera with you. And that's what I did. Yeah. And I mean, I've taken some bad pictures. More. I've taken a lot of bad pictures, but um, I, I hate regretting a picture. Like, what does that mean? Okay. I was at a party in New York in old days, in the 80s, and my friend Gene Stein gave a birthday party for Tennessee women. Luck. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and she said, you know, I even invited Liz Smith, who was the gossip columnist yeah. for the New York Post. Oh. I mean, you know, like Carly Simons, right? I don't, I'm not going to name drop too much. Bryce Martin. <laughs> <laughs> but she said, you know, I've never met any of these people. <laughs> she said, in respect for Tennessee, Tom, uh, I'm asking everybody not to bring their cameras. And you know, we're gonna just have the birthday party. So I walk in this place without my camera, and there on the city in, in her drawing room was Tennessee Williams in deep conversation with Truman 
Huh? And I thought, the wine had got away. You know, <laughs> if I was some kind of a decent photographer, I would have gone against her admonition. Oh, no. Are you still friends with her? She died. <laughs> <laughs> and you should have taken that picture. But it might have killed me. <laughs> okay, so that does raise some interesting questions because she obviously was worried that her guests would be uncomfortable. Right? Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I so don't want to get into the question of portraiture and the nature of portraiture and the exploitative nature of portraiture. And oh God, please let's not have to start doing that. But that she was trying to protect her guests, right? So what kind of bad guess would you have been to have actually brought a camera and taken that picture? And what would you have done with it? Would well, you, you know, if I'd been Lee Friedlander, I would have had my silent blue like a, I could have surreptitiously taken that picture and nobody would have known. Mm -hmm. would you, so how would you feel about it, though? I feel real good about it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, no, I'll take the pictures that I wish I had. Really? Yeah, and that's yeah. what I say, go over your archive and throw them all out while you're still here. You mean, say who they are and what the date is and everything? Or get rid of the stuff you think yeah, you're not going to Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Oh, okay. Yeah. There's um, always plenty out of that. But, yeah, I mean, I just wonder how, I know it's a missed picture, and I've missed a few too, but I'm, in that case, I think I would feel not, not too yeah. many. Well, I was just illustrating And you got it. If you, everybody in this room has that picture in their mind. Yeah. More people have seen that picture right now than probably would have seen it had you actually taken it. Because Thank they you for keeping that tradition. Now, well, yeah. my point in not just talking about that picture uh, in particular is that if you don't carry a camera with you and you so you're a photographer, you might miss something. And I don't want to do that, so. And you carry multiple cameras, right? I mean, you've got, you've, that uh, one you carry, the little like I carry the little like in the and um, I try and try to go back to the roll of flex and film. Right. I've not been terribly successful in going back to film. Um, can you talk about why? It's just so hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're still doing it, so. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's hard. It was hard to make the transition, but um, after I quit doing a few jobs on a corporate type level, you know, like working in offices and stuff, I would still get calls from maybe the New York Times Magazine or Vanity Fair. I, I worked there as a photo editor one time as well. That was one of those, I quit your fire jobs. <laughs> but they knew I was a photographer and you know, occasionally people would call up and say, go take a picture for me. So I did that for a while. What was the question, Carol? I don't know, but I'm kind of interested. <laughs> and, uh, so you gave up commercial work. Well, I, I had to make the leap to the digital world because so many people wanted me to because they wanted the work the next day. You know, we don't have time for a view to take the photos and film and make the contacts. And then, you know, we it is, it, a process. is it a is there a movement out in the commercial world? And I've never done commercial photography, but is there a move now? Maybe I should address this to Lang toward more film work. I mean, it has a, there's a certain effect. You know, the films there's a curve that's going back. I think there is a I potential mean, of the swing. So many back. people in this audience. The so-called young people. Yeah, he just raised his hand back there. Wait, the the are you using film? Yeah, yes, ma'am. I brought a Polaroid 600 to see the child dog, Mary. <laughs> no, there you go. Uh, with myself and a, a fellow back here on probably the sixth and fifth row, uh, we should exclusively film just for fun, like not professional, but yeah. Uh, yeah, and then we've got Ashley Coleman, we've got Ashley Gates, we've got. 
Pat Sansone. We've got people in this audience that I'm leaving out that are Kim working Rushing. in film. You're still working in film, I am. Kim Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yes. I feel like um, an old person sometimes, but we actually have people come to Sumner, Mississippi, and call it Great North South. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, they're, they're kind of younger photographers that are making a pilgrimage, I don't know for what reason, uh, but I don't know, just to see us, and we're welcoming to all strangers, mostly. Yeah, a lot of those people are working in film, and I don't know, there's just something very heartening about it. So, but do you, you sense a difference in the aesthetic? I mean, those pictures yeah. in your show could not have been taken digitally, so many of them. Is that, is that your feeling, or am I just um, reading it? Do you know that picture that you loved so much of Langdon in the car with the flower? Don't no, tell me it's digital. That was taken with this little light. I know. <laughs> there it is. So it's not the quality of the picture necessarily, it's the expression on his face. Y'all go look at that picture. It's just one of the best pictures in the show. It's a profile of Lang. He has a like a totally startled look in his eye, like he's just seen, you know, the infinite. And, you know, on the other side of the windshield. It's pretty, it's a pretty well, tell Sally the reason. It looks like that was because of the, like the last five minutes of the light. Well, everybody knows that that's the yeah, right. And he was stopping the car. I was stopping the car. You know, he said we're late for this dinner party, and I said I'm taking this picture. This light is too good. So that was this expression. It was probably one of you know. Oh, well, that's, I mean, the, the pictures of the kids ages yeah. and ages ago, they're the same thing. They, they would be this kind of glazed over look yeah. that could be interpreted and was interpreted many different ways by different people. But it was, it's the look that people get when you're a slow photographer. Yeah. You know? well, I mean, you're making them hold still when they don't want to. I'm just sure, most of them. you know, when we get to the kids, I'm not going to open a bunch of cans of worms. Oh, God. Uh, yeah, we're staying away from that. Um, but, you know, I know when I photographed my children, there was this point where they just sort of either pretended or didn't really even pay attention to the fact that I was there with my camera. And I got so many beautiful pictures of my children because, I mean, they were the perfect subjects because they, they just went about their business, do it, living their lives, even though their mother was this intrusive person with a camera. And I didn't set out, I didn't set out to make a record of my family at all. What did you set out to do? Did I set out to find to make a life? No, what? to find the right person in the right life. Yeah. And, you know, we were together a lot. You know that, the three children. We were together a lot. And I thought, you know, well, I can either really fight this or I can make this into my work. So, who did I photograph? Yeah, a lot. Because they were there and they were in the right light a lot of the time. <laughs> But I, I've never really talked to them about how they feel about it. There, there may be some hard people. <laughs> right. Any dissenting views in the Clay family in this room? <laughs> yeah, would you recommend to a modern photographer, a, a young a mother, to do what we did? Yes, I would. I mean, you've got the perfect subject and you end up with a record of your family. What could be more wonderful? What if it's the record your children don't want? I mean, uh, we were lucky. We had children who's always absolutely, without qualification, at least in my case, supported the work. Yeah. And still do. But that might not be the case for someone else's. And particularly, I mean, how do you see the influence of social media affecting that? I mean, even if you don't put it on social media, that's 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 a big question these days. It really is. Yeah. And you know, I'm guilty of putting things on Facebook and Instagram and 
She's the most professional person I've ever known. 